Welcome back, my beautiful friends. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York. I am your host, Zen Sams. Today in our Fly Me to the Moon segment, we are chatting with one of Virgin Galactic's founding astronauts, Per Wimmer, and we are discussing space travel, the space industry, and his reaction to Russia's space director threatening to end cooperation with partners at the International Space Station until Western sanctions are lifted. That's a big threat. Now, this is despite NASA saying earlier this month that Russia was committed to the ISS. Now, we're going to get Pear's opinion on this as well. On a more uplifting note in space talk, Jeff Bezos's Blue Origin continues to launch successful space tourism missions, and Jeff hopes to make these supersonic launches into a mainstay of pop culture. Now, Blue Origin's direct competitor is Virgin Galactic, and they are currently selling seats for $450,000, and that's up from its previous price point of around $250,000. There has always been significant interest in the final frontier, and as commercial space companies work to make space tourism a viable market, we may not have to wait too much longer for the price of admission to actually come back down to Earth. Exciting scientific developments are funded by very impressive levels of investment. And while most private aerospace companies are research focused, a market for sending non-astronauts to space is definitely emerging as flights become autonomous and no longer require a trained astronaut to operate the craft. And in the next decade, the value of the space industry as a whole is expected to double from 400 billion to 800 billion. And 2021 was a historic year for commercial space travel. A record number of civilian orbital and suborbital missions launched very successfully. And as with everything in its early stages, Space tourism today is unattainably expensive, although demand appears to be strong enough to keep existing companies in this market very busy for several years. But eventually, as technology matures and more companies enter the industry, prices will hopefully go down. And going in space in the future will feel more like going to Europe. And here to chat some more is Per Wimmer. Welcome back and congrats. I heard you recently visited the USS Nimitz. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. It was a, a fantastic and really cool experience, to be honest. And, and thank you for having me here on the show. Um, it was amazing flying into San Diego and experiencing uh, a sort of um, a Top Gun experience. Uh, I know the Top Gun movie is coming out here in May, Top Gun 2. So it was almost a prelude to that. Uh, absolutely fantastic. Uh, it was one of my bucket list items to fly into San Diego, get on the naval bases in Coronado. We then, together with, with a bunch of other adventures, got onto a C2 Greyhound, uh, which is a, a, basically an old cargo plane where you're sitting the wrong way around in the plane. And we flew in out in the Pacific Ocean and landed on the U.S. aircraft carrier, the Nimitz, off the Nimitz class. So obviously one of the biggest aircraft carriers in the world. And, and that was a thrilling and amazing experience. I mean, it's basically like landing on a floating airport with a town underneath. This uh, aircraft carrier can carry up to 5,000 people on board, 80 aircraft. Um, I mean, it's unbelievable the scale, the size, let alone the fact when you're flying in, landing on that flight deck, and where you've got to get that hook underneath the plane tracked across these wires, these three wires that goes across the landing strip. So to make sure that you stop there and then you get a very brutal stop when, when, when you land there. Really exciting. It sounds very exciting. Now, the USS um, Nimitz is a supercarrier of the United States Navy and the lead ship of her class. So, wow, that is definitely one on the bucket list. It's one of the largest warships in the world. Now, was this mission philanthropic or work related? Um, it was basically uh, uh, through some of my uh, astronaut contacts, I've, I've managed to make my way into uh, a visit there. It's actually been a long time in the making, taking more than two and a half years. COVID obviously being a slowdown factor and my inability to get into the US uh, counted. But suddenly the window was open. And uh, so for me, uh, being a, a future astronaut and love flying, I've flown MiGs at 80,000 feet um, at Mark III in, the, in, the, in Russia. And I've also flown L-39. Oh, let's, let's talk about Russia. This is a great segue. This is very impressive stuff, what you've done. So I want to pick your brain. Now, 
uh, a NASA astronaut, Mark Van de Hei, uh, I think I'm pronouncing his name right, and two cosmonauts returned to Earth this week from the ISS aboard a Russian um, Soyuz spare, uh, spacecraft, uh, the Soyuz, right? Before their landing, Dmitry Rogozin, who's Russia's space director, threatened that Russia would either shut down or detach the primary engines that keep ISS in orbit and would not intervene if the spacecraft risked falling back to Earth in an uncontrolled deorbit. What do you say to this? And what are we really facing here if the Russians implode this? Well, it's a really sad day for space, to be honest, because historically, if you go back the past three decades, uh, space collaborations amongst China, Russia, US, Europe has always been consistent, friendly, collaborative. We all work together for the common goal, no matter what the geopolitics on planet Earth have been, uh, how much we have been disagreeing with China or having issues with Russia space has always been collaborative even when when china put the uh, the probe on the far end of the moon it was they could only have done it with help from nasa and with uh, the european space agency so it was super collaborative even though china took the credit for it so uh, it's really a sad day to see that now finally with with the uh, ukrainian situation and now finally space is also kind of uh, uncollaborating again now the problem is perhaps uh, less severe as it would have been say five years ago when uh, the soyuz was the only way to get people up to the international space station uh, two mitigating factors here seen from a U.S. perspective. One is uh, the Falcon 9 is a perfectly good rocket. It will take people up and down. So the U.S. now has its own capabilities of shuttling astronauts back and forth. And secondly, uh, there is a plan, and this is the default plan, to actually retire the ISS uh, in, in due course or the, or the next years because it's simply getting very old. So the problem gets less and less uh, problematic for those two factors. But as, a, as an astronaut, I'm, I'm personally saddened about it because we learn more from collaborating than from uh, doing our own things separately. I couldn't agree more. And we know for a fact that the ISS can't function properly without both Russia and the U.S. participating. So that is very sad. Now, let's move on to something a little bit more uplifting. We have about three minutes left. And let's talk about the um, fast growing space industry. Now, though COVID-19 did see the slowest quarter of space infrastructure since 2009 last year, was the largest on record for investment in infrastructure, reaching over, fifth, reaching over 5 billion. Now, in the first quarter of this year, space in infrastructure companies raised the combined $3.6 billion pair. Things are moving fast. Where is the industry headed? I think uh, from a private sector perspective, uh, the space sector is super, super exciting at the moment. In uh, 2021 alone, the private space sector raised uh, raised about $15 billion, which is roughly the budget of NASA. And that's up 50% on the year prior. So things are really accelerating a lot within space. Uh, you could say they're really on, on Mark 5 here. And, and that's very exciting because the private sector has a key role to play. When the private sector gets involved, you get lower cost, you get better uh, offers, more innovation, et cetera. I mean, let's not forget, it was during the Apollo program and the need for computers in the Apollo that effectively created uh, Silicon Valley because we needed all these microchips and we needed to figure out difficult stuff real time. So the space sector has a lot to contribute when it comes to telecom industry, um, uh, to the pharmaceutical industry doing microgravity gravity experiences, uh, let alone taking people like myself up and, and pushing the boundaries further and further out. And if you ask Elon Musk, push it all the way to Mars. So this is really an exciting, exciting time for private space uh, with, with that amount of capital going in. Without a doubt. I mean, listen, despite the numerous obstacles from cost to safety to technological restrictions, space tour tourism is a sector that is set to really develop rapidly over the next decade and that we've been reading about it. But the successful development of, of reusable launch systems is also a big step towards lowering costs enough to make it a viable market. Um, there's just about a minute left, but talk to me about the importance of reusable rockets and what that means for space tourism. 
Oh, it's super important. I mean, I had two of my <clears throat> astronaut friends that went up on, on Thursday, the 31st of March uh, on Jeff Bezos' rocket up and down. Uh, that's now proven that it works. It takes people up, it takes people safely down again. <laughs> on, on, on Wednesday, a, April uh, 6, we will see uh, uh, my other friend, Michael Lobos Alegria, who's an ex NASA astronaut, 10 EVAs, and, and, and three missions into space. He's going to do the first private mission to the International Space Station. So, really exciting stuff. So we saw sandwiched in between two very big launches here. And, and I think uh, you will see more and more of these things uh, coming. And, and I think that's, that's super exciting and, and really appreciate the, uh, the people pushing this. Yes, without a doubt. Well, thank you so much for your insight. It's always such a pleasure talking to you. I really appreciate you coming on. That was our Fly Me to the Moon segment. Thank you, Per. Thank you. See you in space. Definitely, guys, check him out. Go on wimmerspace.com, wimmerspace.com, or check him out on the gram at per.wimmer, P-E-R dot wimmer with two M's. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York. That was our Fly Me to the Moon segment. We'll be right back after this.